Welcome everybody to the Investors Podcast 2.0, Wealth Mindset, where we dive into the minds of the successful real estate entrepreneur to uncover the tips and tricks that have allowed them to keep moving forward. I am your host, Scott Bauer, and I'm excited that you're here with us. Everybody, it's another episode of the Invest in This Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bauer, and super pumped today. We got Jared Dallas with us, Equity Connect. We're gonna talk about some real estate today. We're gonna talk about some real estate today. So, Jared, what's up, man? How are you? Dude, good man. So happy to be on this podcast. I'm excited. Man, I'm excited too. You know, for all you loyal listeners that have stuck with us, you know that I get excited on every episode because we've always got good content that's gonna move your business and your life forward. But specifically, Jared and I connect because uh, we've been in the business for about the same time or around the same amount of time and both have you know, been able to, to thrive in this market, in the super hot market of Phoenix, Arizona. And so, um, Jared, why don't you give the listeners a little bit more about your background and kind of what you're focused on now? Yeah, absolutely. So started in 2015, um, started just like everybody else, you know, we're in Phoenix. Real estate prices, I think, aside from Florida and, and Las Vegas, we took one of the biggest hits. So this was really a hotbed for flick, fix and flip activities. So naturally, trying to get in the industry, a lot of the colleagues I was networking with were all fix and flippers. And uh, similar to you know what everybody sees on HGTV and how they glamorize the industry, that's naturally kind of the direction I wanted to go. So, um, you know, I started off as an engineer, uh, Johnson Controls, I quit, I uh, just wasn't passionate about the corporate structure, but kind of a double-edged sword, I was, I was fortunate to understand how a Fortune 60 company ran because I took what I liked and didn't like and applied it to kind of the business that I, that I have now. So, um, so yeah, I started, you know, left Johnson Controls, I started flipping, uh, flip, bought two houses right next to each other made every mistake in the book, right? Um, over budget, over time. I think those projects took like eight months. But the thing was, the market was going up like this, that I could have made every mistake in a book and I would have been okay. Um, so started off flipping. Uh, I guess long story short, the people who sold me those flips were, were wholesalers and they popped, I think, 10 or 15 on each one of, the, each one of those houses. And, uh, you know, I'm like, Hey, look, I put in, you know, I leveraged the houses. So I was 50 grand cash in each one to make 25 over a nine month period. And I'm like, I mean, I have so much risk out there. Um, I, I want to do what that guy was doing. So, so, uh, I, I made a decision of, Hey, I'm, if this, if this guy and, you know, wholesalers back then, you know, they weren't the most glamorous of individuals. I'm like if this guy, if this guy could go and, and be successful and buy these houses for pennies on a dollar, I guarantee I could do it 10 times better. So that's exactly what I did. Started, uh, was flipping in 15, partnered up with some partners and all we did was wholesale, right? We flipped every now and then, but it wasn't, we didn't like to put our cash out into, out into the marketplace. Um, so we started off nationwide. I think we did in 2017, about 150 deals in just about every MSA across North America. And it was a big pain in the ass. Um, inefficiencies, didn't know how to run numbers. We had to start from square one with buyers. Every time we got a deal, it was just, it was, there's just a lot of stress on, on the business. So we consolidated down and said, we'll just focus on Phoenix and Las Vegas. And that's exactly what we've been doing for the last probably two and a half years. So, um, so yeah, I've been, I mean, high level wholesale company. We've done everything from, you know, run lean to scale to an $80,000 budget per month. You know, the expensive systems, the expensive office, you know, pretty much have, have done it all, done a, done a ton of deals. Um, fast forward to today, um, this, you know, we're, we're in 2020 and this has a, been a very unique and kind of a, a challenging, uh, year as you know, cause Corona, uh, back in, I want to say October, October, November. So Q4 of last year, we made a decision of gosh, you know, wholesaling. It's a freaking grind, man. It's like, you're only good as your last deal. You're, you're continuing to dump money into the machine to just catch you up from the last month, pay the overhead for this month, and then you're left over with this, you know, little bit amount of, of cash that's left over, right? right. Uh, it could be big, it could be small, you could be negative. I lost a quarter million dollars um, 
in, in a quarter uh, back in 2019, um, there's a lot of risk associated with wholesaling. So we made the decision of, look, we don't want to do this forever, right? We want to figure out how to, you know, build a, build a foundation, a book of assets, actually strengthen the, the balance sheet. So we made the decision of we need to start, you know, stacking rentals, right? Um, we'll cherry pick the best assets in the best locations. Um, only if we could be all in at 75% after a full blown construction job, because we don't want the headache. We're really trying to strive for, you know, rental real estate is not passive by any means. I don't care what anybody no. says. No. So, uh, but we want to harden these assets enough where we're not getting the calls. We can run more efficiently and we can attract a better tenant profile. So we're not dealing with pain in the ass people. Um, but it has to hit those 75% all in numbers. So between, I want to say December and now, we've purchased, I think we have probably low 20s, um, new single families added to the portfolio, all super strong, healthy, great tenants. And um, nobody says we could cash flow in Phoenix, but I mean, the rents are going insane right now. We're consistently getting between 200 and 300 bucks above market rent and they're renting in a day. So, um, you know, probably last year, you're lucky to cash flow a buck 50, 200 a door after you put some long-term debt on them. Uh, but now price per square foot and rents have shot up. I think Phoenix was the number one rental appreciating market in the United States uh, in 2019 at 11% appreciation in rents. Right. So we're not only are we a strong market, but our rents have notoriously been low for a long, long time. And finally they're starting to catch up to the asset values, which has been amazing. So um, we've been stacking as many rentals that make sense just so we could have a hedge against the, the possibility of us saying, hey, look, let's not wholesale anymore. Let's not flip anymore. We have a balance sheet to fall back on. Right. Um, and on top of that, I think we have about 30, 30 homes that we bought, that we purchased um, with subject to financing that we've seller financed out. So we have cash flow from about 30 different notes, which is pretty cool. So um, there, there's a lot of different variables and, and not to stop you there, but I, I mean, it, as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking of several questions I want to ask you um, because just on your last there, creative financing, put together creative deals, you're taking down stuff subject to the existing financing that the seller has in place. And then you're turning around and your owner financing them to an end user, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. There, there's a lot of issues and problems that can happen out of that that can stem from that, right? Um, mm -hmm. I guess let's let's start all the way at the beginning because I think it's important for listeners out there that are listening to this that maybe can correlate and relate to you uh, and your story. You start as an engineer and then you got into real estate investing from there. How has the transition been from you know being a, an engineer somebody who's very green i call you a green personality very numbers oriented very structured right and going into the real estate investment space where things aren't always all, all that structured and sometimes you have to be more flexible i mean was there a challenge in doing that um you know there, there's always a challenge you know i mean i'm i'm highly technical in pretty much anything i anything i do almost to a fault but i've at the same time i've always been Kind of that entrepreneur like even from a very very young age like when i was in you know middle school high school whatever it was like i just knew like the way i thought was a lot different than you know some of my close group of friends yep. i was always the guy to come up with you know crazy ideas not only did i come up with those ideas but i was an extremely good executor um and i always found like really kind of innovate not innovative and weird kind of ride that fine line ways to make money. Um, so I've always been really, I think it's money driven. And on top of that, not only am I money driven, I, my, I love building things. I love putting together an idea and then coming up with a structure on how we're going to execute that idea. It's kind of funny because um, my partner compliments me very, very well because I'm, I'm the visionary and I can put together a roadmap on how we're going to execute this thing because for me the vision or the end product is just so clear when you're when you're when what you want is so clear it's just like 
it's just, okay, now I, I know what it is. I'm right here. Like, how do we navigate the path to get there in the most efficient way possible? Efficient way is important. Um, keyword, keyword. Keyword. Because <laughs> you, could, you could take 30 years to do something, but that's not anything I'm really interested in. Amen. So, um, but the, the thing is, there's a, like with real estate, there are a lot of problems that pop up. But as you've accumulated knowledge and you have a solid process and your team, more importantly, they, they learn how to think like you do. It's pretty cut and dry in my opinion. Yeah, there's, there's seller issues, but that's really the only variable. Anything with title to me is technical. There's always a solution and there's always a creative way to kind of arrive at the end result to get it done. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate you sharing that. I think that there's a lot of, because everybody can assimilate with that, right? They can relate to that fact of trying to make a transition and then you know, some people give up. Maybe that's where I'm going with that. Some people give up and you were able to overcome that and, and continue to thrive in it. So, um, you know, moving forward from there, you built up, um, you know, you kind of transitioned your business from a wholesale, but from fix and flip to wholesale. Then now you're going into longer term rentals. Um, and I'm glad you brought up the, the idea about cash flow as well, because you absolutely can cash flow uh, in Phoenix. I've been cash flowing here with my portfolio. You just got to be very, very selective in what it is that you're buying, correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What about downward protection? So let's say, um, and I guess that'll, I'll just move on across this. When you're buying property subject to the existing financing from a, from a seller and then turn around in owner financing, how are you protecting yourself? How do you know that you know, you're not putting the seller in a bind who you're taking over their existing financing and how do you protect yourself on the on, on the owner finance side as well yeah good uh good point um so when we when we tie up these properties we're we're literally getting the property deeded over to us it's going through title everything's clear we're good to go but when we sell it on seller financing we're selling them on contract for deed so more of a wrap yep so if uh, if the new buyer <clears throat> fails to perform, then we we default them. We're able to step in place of that buyer and continue making those mortgage payments. And I, and and I asked that question because there's there are several ways that you can construct these deals to make. And I'm glad that you're doing it that way because you're you're not really putting the seller at risk, and you're in a financial position where, at least now, until you probably you know if you had. 200 of these things and they all defaulted, you might have some problems, but you know, the, the, the reality is that probably won't happen. Uh, but you're protecting your seller by doing that, right? Um, Absolutely. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, I think it's, I, I think it's very, I think it's very, very important that you're able to structure the deal in such a way that you could always step in and, and pay in the case of a buyer default. Um, there's, I mean, this type of like structure is relatively gray. It's not illegal, but if you if you jack it up, you will have the attorney general on your ass um, because you're you're playing with people's credit, right? Um, you know, there's people out there who who do it incorrectly, and it it gives kind of this structure a really really bad name, which is why it's important to to be ethical. You're really you're you're you have somebody's livelihood in, in your hands and you just can't mess around with it. So would you say though, for the listeners out there that maybe are in a similar situation where they're, you know, they're in a market where it's hard to wholesale or they're trying to find the grasp of a, of a, of an exit strategy in this business, would you say that it's a lucrative one if you're doing it correctly? Explain that for, for a minute to the listeners here. I would, I would say so. Um, typically, you know, this structure was really working when when either a market is super overheated and it's hard to find equity deals to either wholesale or flip. And it also works in a market that is just extremely, I guess, depressed. Some of those tertiary markets, maybe it's the burbs or like rural areas of Texas where, okay, you get a house that's worth 30. Like, what do you, what do, you do with that, right? That's, you know, probably, you know, 30% of the replacement value of the actual house. So um, in areas, you know, similar to those, it makes sense because, you know, it's either somebody wants an, a crazy amount of money and, and the only way it works is a profit and loss type of play, um, or you're in an area where it's just like, there's no buyers. Like, what, what do you do? Like, even if 
like there's not even FHA won't even lend on, on those houses. Right. So the only option in that, in that case are, you know, just take over, either have a seller carry back a mortgage with very little down and the key is very little down um, or have them wrap their existing financing and not, not put anything down. So um, it, it, the, the biggest thing, and it, this is because it's a cash flow play, you want to put, you want to lay out as list as little amount of cash as humanly possible. That way you're always in a position to either break even after you've stabilized it with a new buyer or you've made money in that case um, on the, uh, just the down payment arbitrage as, right. as Sean Terry calls it. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And it's been ever more prevalent. I mean, I've had several podcasts, uh, obviously the loyal listeners know that about creative finance and had some uh, pretty big players on here that, you know, are structuring deals in, in several different ways, but, I feel like as the markets continue to turn, we're going to see more and more of this become prevalent. I also see where people are not structuring these correctly, where sometimes those people are going to put, put themselves in a really big bind and all of a sudden they're going to find themselves in some serious trouble if they have not structured these deals correctly. Right. And so I, I wanted to touch on you a little bit of just how you structure things and how maybe, you know, you are, you're uh, beating that downside protection so that you're not putting yourself in a bind. Right. And I like what you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, in this market, let's specifically talk about Phoenix. You know, we talk about it being, uh, you know, a hard market to be in. We talk about, you know, harder to find deals and you kind of have uh, gone away from the wholesale market from the fix and flip and are going more into rentals. Let's talk about that. Why would somebody want to do that? Why would somebody want to go on hard asset, you know, put your money in a hard asset where you maybe only cash flow three to 500 bucks max a month? Um, why would somebody want to do that? You know, though, I know we're talking, you know, before the show started, um, we made the decision probably 18 months ago that, you know, wholesaling, it's, it's a grind, flipping is a grind. Granted, we're like almost every wholesale deal that we bring in today, we're flipping it. That way we could keep our marketing costs low, our overhead low, and really increase the amount of, act, you know, absolute dollars coming into the company. Um, so we're flipping a ton, but at the same time, it's, you know, you're only, is you're, you're chasing, it's a, it's a vicious cycle. You're just chasing the money to pay for your overhead and then the spread. That's what you get. To, that's what you get to keep. Um, so at the end of it all, if you decide to stop working or some, you know, God forbid something happened and you can't work, you know, you don't have any assets that will pay you a dividend to take care of you in, into the future. So, um, we don't plan on wholesaling forever flipping. So stacking rentals for us was a hedge against that eventual exit in the future, whenever that is, we're, we're still going to do this for a very long time, but um, we're mainly using it as a vehicle to, to stash away, you know, the best assets and the best locations. Um, but we're only taking those assets if it fits, you know, those, those three criteria, good asset, typically of newer construction, in a good location, anywhere from a B minus to a, to an A mark, uh, a sub market. And then third, that we could be all in at 75% of the value after a full blown renovation. That way, when we stabilize and refinance out with permanent financing, we could pull out a majority of our, we pull out a majority of our cash. Right. Um, at the same time, because you're rehabbing these things so well, um, you're hardening the asset. So very minimal CapEx maintenance, maintenance calls, and you're attracting the best tenant profile out there. So you're not at the mercy of, hey, who's gonna rent my you know, piece of crap that still looks like an REO house in the REO days, right? right. So um, you're kind of, the thing with rentals, it's, it's, it's an asset like anything else. When you go into an asset and you're putting capital into the market, you really have to, you have to attack every downside like, option that, that could arise. And that's really how we mitigate as much risk as we're holding assets at the top of the market. But like you said, it's just a, it's just a way to create as much cash flow um, as we can. And that's the goal of the company is stack as many units as efficiently possible while maintaining a healthy capital structure. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, you're strengthening, strengthening the balance sheet. You're not just a, a P and L guy, like a majority of the wholesale guys are. Plus you look strong to the banks and you could, you know, the banks will lend to you because you have a strong balance sheet. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I appreciate you that or explaining that a little bit, but I want to talk about 
you know, your choice of going into, you know, the single families versus, I mean, you're talking about stacking these as quickly as possible. I know that some listeners on this show are apartment investors and syndicators and people that, you know, have, have amassed large quantities of units using apartments and things like that. Why are you choosing to do single family uh, or even condos, townhomes, things like that, where they're single individual owned or leased? Um, so in, in my opinion, so at, at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're in a very supply constrained rental market. There's not enough, obviously there's not enough housing units and there's not enough rental units out in the marketplace. So any re- asset class of rental will thrive right now, but in my opinion and kind of my philosophy is, and just talking with other economists like John Burns and some other top guys is, you know, up apartments the majority of them are in the urban core of cities right you're it's very you know very dense you're typically you're in multi-story type of apartment buildings but a lot of those buildings are filled with millennials and the the fact is those millennials are are growing up right they're getting married um they, they have a little dog or whatever and they just need they need more space right so the, the philosophy with um, SFR and, and townhome stuff where, you know, they're individually platted um, is that this is the next, this is the next transition to capture that little cohort, that little segment of, of that millennial population. And then it's even more so prevalent now that, you know, Corona is, is you know, part of our daily lives. Right. People just don't want to be stuck in highly dense, you know, uh, urban centers. They you know, that's why you see the suburbs blowing up. People are trying to get away from that, those urban, um, those dense urban, urban spots. So single family is attractive because, you know, you have, you have your own space. You're not those, you're, it's not an efficiency unit. We're still talking anywhere from 1500 to 1700 square foot, uh, whether they're townhomes or, or SFR, they all have their own yard. So we've created that privacy and it's just a more stable asset class, right? If you look at the trend between, if you look at rental growth trends between SFR and apartment buildings, uh, apartment building rents are relatively volatile as the economy fluctuates. But if you look at SFR rents, they are just freaking rock solid. Um, you know, granted, they may go horizontal for a period of time, but they're always trending upwards. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that people, they're not going to go away. You know, I remember five years ago, uh, maybe five or six years ago when I was in the apartment syndication space more so than I am now, you know, my thought was, Hey, apartments make a lot of sense. We want to move there. You got two major generations of people, the millennials and the baby boomers, both of which want to go to an apartment because they don't want to own a home. They don't want, you know, they want to be more transient. They want to, they don't want to have all the repairs that they have to do, et cetera. And since that time now, now we're in 2020, I have changed my mind on that completely, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, and, and COVID and whatever has just made it even more of a, uh, an ab- absolute thing, right? Like people don't want to be in an apartment building. They don't want to be surrounded by, uh, you know, right next door to many other people. They want to have their own space, want to have some freedom. And just like you talked about, um, they're going outside of the suburb or out into the suburbs. If you go up like in Northern Arizona, Flagstaff, Sedona, I mean, the prices are insane right now. It is crazy. Mm-hmm. It is crazy. Absolutely. And also another, <clears throat> another interesting, um, you know, something that I wasn't even, even at the top of my mind was, and someone made a good point was that, um, you know, retirement communities, like your 55 older plus population, uh, there, a lot of them are no longer, you know, going to those like active adult living style communities, right? Because you have the millennials are growing up and they're getting married and their parents, they no longer want to be, a, you know, be in a mix of active adults. They're actually selling, um, selling their homes and moving closer because they want to be closer to the grandchildren not only are the millennials growing up and getting out of their urban core into more, more of a suburban area, but you also have their parents moving down and wanting to be closer to family and the grandchildren. It's such an interesting, I've been um, reading a lot of stuff. I'm listening to Ray Dalio's book principles right now, again, for the second time. And it just continues to remind me of how things continually change. Right. Like, I mean, even in the time we've been in the business, the market has changed dramatically, although we have not had a big downturn yet, 
um, it, it's just crazy how things have fluctuated. And even what you're mm -hmm. talking about with the, the baby boomers and the millennial generation and how they're, how they're connected to each other and what they're doing in response to each other's growth is pretty wild. What do you think they're going to do? I mean, 55 plus communities here in Phoenix are pretty big. There's several of them around town. What do you think is going to happen with those? You know, I, I'm not completely sure, you know, it's, <clears throat> I couldn't, I couldn't tell you, but I just know through my family and, and my colleagues, you know, a lot, a lot of, I mean, um, my, my in-laws actually just, you know, they move five houses down from us because, you know, they want to be closer to the kids. And as we get married, you know, they could, you know, they, they could be more involved. And I think a lot of our generation, not a lot of people stay, you know, where they grew up, like back in our parents' days, it wasn't, wasn't uncommon for them to, you know, go through, you know, high school, college, get a job in their town and then buy a house in that town. Our generation, we're a little bit more, we're a little bit more, um, not transient, but we value um, different things and what our, our, um, our parents valued. Like the millennials, they don't really care about owning a house, right? Because they all saw their parents get bit during the, during the downturn. Um, they rather rent, be safe, and then spend that extra income on experiences, whether it's traveling internationally or spending money on nice restaurants and things that they value experience and, and, and culture like substantially more. Um, so, you know, as we kind of leave the nest and go into all these different areas across the United States, you know, leave our parents, you know, they're, they're still at their spot. So that's why I think that different, however we arrived at that type of mentality, you know, we've left the nest. Now our parents want to come back and, and enjoy the rest of life with us. Yeah, no, it is. That is very interesting for sure. I mean, I'm from Iowa. I'm here in Phoenix, right? And as I continue to, you know, build a family and whatnot, my parents have already expressed interest about moving out here. So that's exactly what you're talking about. And you got to think about that and try to like look down the road to see where things are going to try to shift to to the best of our knowledge. Of course, we don't have a crystal ball. I mean, I wouldn't be talking to you if I did, uh, you know, but I try to make the best guess that I can uh, and make the smartest uh, investment decision based on that. So um, let's talk about that. I mean, where do you think we're going to go? Where, where, where's Equity Connect going to be? Where, where are you going to be at five years from today? So oh, <clears throat> we're, I mean, we're, we're using our, our fix and flip and our wholesale business to generate as much cash as we can. Yep. Um, but not only are we kind of taking that cash and allocating them into um, existing rentals to hold for a long period of time, but we've kind of figured out that, you know, as we went through this, this journey of stacking rentals over the last 18 months, it's, it's relatively inefficient because, you know, you have a, a marketing spend attached to that deal. And then we have a whole operation. We have a lot of overhead associated with that deal. And on top of that, you know, you're buying existing assets where you're, you're renovating them like site by site. You maybe have different GCs. They're all different ages. You have different demographics. And so it's just, it's just a lot, you know, it's, it's almost like you're hustling wholesale. It's, you know, you're, it's the same thing with, with the one-off existing single families. Yeah. So um, we, we looked out into the, looked out into the future and we're like, okay, how are we going to get to, you know, 500, a thousand units? Like, how is that possible? And, you know, we, 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 you know, came to the realization that it's not possible with what we have going right now. It's just not scalable. So we looked in the, another direction and just going to like various conferences like IMN and listening to some of the public guys and, and really seeing how they've positioned themselves at like through, through this cycle. It's a lot of them are building smaller subdivisions or actually probably larger subdivisions and strictly for rentals. That way they have full control of their product. Um, it's an e way easier to operate them. And then you could stack units much quicker because, you know, go buy a 20 acre piece of land and go put a hundred units on it. Single families, boom, like there's, there's a hundred units granted you got entitlement risk and builder risk. Um, but if you're renting these things out, there's a lot less risk attached to it because you're, you're long on the investment. You're not trying to sell them uh, to a consumer and then hope the market's okay and hope interest rates stay low. Sure. So that's, that's kind of the, um, that's the direction that we've decided to go um, is building, whether it's high density SFR, 
you know, while we, you know, with, with privacy and kind of targeting those same challenges that, you know, these millennials moving from the urban core down um, really, really want. And then um, also townhome style communities as well. I think it's exciting, man. I like how you think outside the box and I appreciate you kind of being here and explaining you, not only your journey coming up, but your philosophy on what, what, you know, how things are moving forward. Cause uh, it's an uncertain time right now, right? There's a lot of people that are just very unclear with the direction of where they want to go and how they're, how they want to execute their life. And, um, you know, you, you clearly spent some time to figure that out for yourself. And I think it's an admirable for sure for a lot of people. Um, Jared, uh, we're getting down to the sake of time here. Uh, are you ready for a little lightning round here? <laughs> yes. All right. Let's, uh, let's start off with the first question. It's pretty important. Uh, the mindset obviously is, is uh, of very much importance. How do you feel that it affects your life and your business every day? So, you know, probably about a year and a half ago, um, my, the thing about my mind is like I see very little risk, you know, just because I'm able to establish such a strong vision and kind of the, the, yeah, high level vision and the structure to, to get there. I've always been successful in that regard, but over the, over the years, you know, there's been, there's been a lot of stress. I've never been a stressed out guy, but as you start to scale and, and, you know, you, you have employees and like you're directly accountable for their, you know, for their well being, sometimes it could become stressful. So, um, so about a year and a half ago, I read, uh, I actually read Miracle Morning and it's kind of what I've already been doing with the exception of affirmations and, and meditation. So what I do every single morning is, you know, whether I go to like a hit class at five or um, go run the block, you know, for a few miles, I'll go get some exercise in and I have a, I just bought a hot tub back here. Uh, I'll just sit naked in my hot tub and meditate for about 10 or 15 minutes. And uh, it's crazy because I realized the first thing I did when I woke up prior to all this, it was just stimulation, right? It was just get out of my bed and we're freaking going. Not just, you know, looking at my cell phone, answering emails, like kind of being more reactive and through kind of shifting my mind with meditation, it just allowed me to slow down for at least 15 minutes in the morning, which allowed me to like center myself, focus, really like interconnect with like the surroundings about me, which I never really did. So I think that's really helped my brain uh, become more, more adaptable and less, and less stressed out. Um, and then one last thing on top of that, just reading, reading a lot about what these high level guys are doing. And cause it really, cause like my vision only goes so far, but by seeing other successful guys, how they came up and how they approach problems and built businesses. Um, I just think to myself, holy shit, I've been doing this. I've been doing this all wrong. So it's great to take some of their experiences and apply it to, to some of the stresses and problems today. Well, and you know, that, that's a great way to explain how, how the mindset affects your life. But, uh, you know, I'm glad that you're incorporating meditation. I think when we first, when we had coffee, you and I had coffee, were we talk about meditation at that point or no? Ah, uh, shoot. I don't, I don't remember. Okay. okay. Anyways, regardless, doesn't matter. It's something I've been doing for a long time. Uh, it's something that's a, it's a 15 minutes in the day. That's my favorite 15 minutes. Exactly. When I first wake up in the morning, I think that for everybody out there, uh, it's applicable for them. You know, that's the time in the day where nobody bothers me, right? That's, that's mm -hmm. the time when it's for me and me only. Uh, and, and same thing for you. So uh, I appreciate you sharing that. As kind of a one-off to what you just talked about, how do you continue to surround yourself or how do you continue to um, keep yourself motivated, even though you've had some success? Uh, you know, how, how do you keep building on that? You know, what do you do? Uh, books, books. I actually, <clears throat> um, last week I, or last two weeks, I read two of them and I highly recommend them. One is, um, uh, the Peebles principles by Donovan Peebles. And the other one is, uh, Steve Schwartzman, whatever it takes, the founder and CEO of Blackstone and how they just from like childhood to where they are today, it just makes you think that, holy shit, I am playing so small. Oh, I am, <laughs> I am playing so small. And the crazy thing is these, these are average guys, you know, they just had, they just had a way of, of working with people and navigating, um, you know, p politics and just not, just not saying no, not putting a limit 
on on what they're doing. I think talking to one of my colleagues the other day, and we're I think we're talking about some Ray Dalio stuff, and he's like, dude, it's like you got to be on the right horse, right? You have the same time and energy in the day. Why would you pick a losing horse when you could pick a, a, a winning horse, right? It's like take like the uh, like a whatever like a triple cup competition whatever it is you have a horse you have two horses one's bad right why would you pump a million dollars into getting that horse show ready versus pumping a million dollars into this horse that's going to take you way farther with greater reward so kind of what i do today is i decide like look am i putting myself in a in a winning position or am i putting myself into a daily grind that doesn't have any scalability uniqueness or a massive market for for revenue and potential so um, reading books really helped me kind of expand and just stop thinking about playing small, really. I, lo- I love that. I love that. What are you reading right now? I'm wrapping up uh, Schwartzman's book. Okay. I got like a couple chapters left. It's like, a, dude, they should make movies out of this thing. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> I think they do. I think they do make movies out of this thing. Just the general person out there doesn't like to watch that type of movie, right? A lot of people do not yeah. like to, not, do not like to, uh, to read. Are you an audible guy or are you a paperback guy? Uh, these guys, these ones are paperbacks. Yeah, yeah, I'm a mix for sure. There's something about reading that uh, I think it's very important, right? I mean, it's different than listening, that's for sure. Absolutely. What are you trying to learn right now? So right now I'm trying to learn new construction. So I've been fortunate enough to find <clears throat> a, uh, a builder here uh, in the Valley He's a production builder, so he builds anywhere from 50 to 200 home subdivisions. And, um, you know, he's, he's been doing this for a while, and he's just looking for a young guy to kind of mentor and teach them the ropes and really just bring him, bring him new energy, right? Because, yeah. I mean, he has, a, he has a full-blown team, but at the end of the day, he's been, you know, it's an older team, and he's looking for a young whip, whippersnapper to kind of, like, get him excited about deals and get him reignited. So, <laughs> snapper, so man. I haven't heard that since I was a kid. That's great. <laughs> so, um, so we're working, we're working some deals and, um, at the same time, he's been gracious enough to really teach me how to get through the city, how to look at land zoning, all this type of different type of stuff. And then when we go ground up, um, just being very, very efficient on, on the construction side. So that's been, that's been amazing. There's a lot of components to go to new, new construction, that's for sure. Um, so that obviously is something that's going to take time, but I'm glad you're going through it. What's your superpower? Like I said, I think my superpower is the ability to create such a strong vision of, of something that I want. Um, and just being able to navigate through the issues and, and put a structure together to, to get there. I'll admit, I know I said I was a, I was a decent operator. I'm not that great of an operator, <laughs> um, which is why my partner's been so amazing. But um, I could create a vision. I could create a roadmap. It's just, for me, it's tedious to, like, get interwoven into, like, the, the, the daily nit, you know, nitty-gritty stuff. Uh, but I think it's just that compelling vision that's, that's been my advantage. I think it's huge. I mean, obviously there's gotta be two a yin and a yang to, uh, you know, there's the visionary and then there is the integrator. You know, it's very, very important to have those two. It sounds like you found that for you, uh, which is great. Um, so next question is how do you like to give back? So I like to give back and I, I'll admit I'm not that great at giving back, but um, it's been more kind of reactive. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> when uh, I have a ton of people call me every single day, I have a ton of people in my, uh, in my DMs. So when somebody has a question, I'll just get them on the phone and just walk them through whatever answer they have. Um, I'll take time out of my day to make sure that, you know, they're, they're not making a bad decision. Um, but I only help people that truly either believe in themselves or they take themselves seriously. I just don't help, you know, one offers who, who's thinking about something or, you know, it's just, just kicking the can around. So you have to be serious. You have to take yourself seriously um, to get my help. So I do, I do help anybody that, that asks for it. Awesome. Well, that uh, leads me next down to the next question, which is how can the listeners find you if they want to learn more about, about you? I know um, Equity Connect is your company. You're uh, trying to do something with Equity Connect. 
right? That the listeners might, may, might be able to help you out with. Where can they find you? So best way to find me is probably on Instagram. It's going to be Jared underscore Vidalis. Okay. <laughs> um, my, my email, my phone is, it's on my profile. So if you need to reach out, just give me a call or drop me an email and I'll get back to you guys. Okay, cool. Sounds good, man. Well, it's really, it's been great having you here today. I'm sure with all the loyal listeners that have stuck to us up to this point, that means they loved it. And I'm sure you'll, you know, get some more DMs. Um, but man, you got some good things going on. I appreciate you being here for sure. Dude, absolutely. Thanks for being on. I'm glad to help with uh, anybody who reaches out. So don't hesitate. Sounds good, man. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Awesome, brother. Thank you.